All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we have the next session starting right now, and the uh, first talk will be by Thorne. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, so, I published my first paper on a language for legal discourse at ICAL in 1989. Um, and I used it in several small projects <clears throat> in subsequent years. In my paper on Eisner versus Macomber in 1995, and my paper on deep semantic interpretations in 2007, I wrote an interpreter for parts of LLD in Prolog, <clears throat> but I never attempted to implement the entire language in a single system, and I never attempt attempted to encode a complete statute. I think the situation is quite different today. So what is LLD? Section two of my extended abstract includes seven subsections that are really mini abstracts for the main features of the language. There are references for each subsection, and these are all available on ResearchGate and easily searchable on Google, so I will not try to summarize these subsections in my talk. Instead, I will show you several examples of statutory encodings in LLD, I will start in each case from the natural language interface in section 2.6, but some of my examples will touch on sections 2.4 and 2.5, dionic modalities and epistemic modalities. If there is time, I will say a few words about section 2.7 on a prototypical perceptual semantics. Okay, so at various times and for various purposes, I've used a different concrete syntax for LLD but you can see that the abstract syntax is the same. Here, the sort or basic type actor has subsorts person and corporation, and stock and bond are both subsorts of security. Also, actor is a count term, and stock is a mass term, which has a measure attached to it. Now, one feature of this syntax, which is unusual in a first order language, is the variable O. Think of O as an instance of the ownership relation, so, so that own can be interpreted as either a predicate or an object, depending on the context. For my ICAL 2007 paper, I worked with Michael Collins' statistical parser from 1999, which was trained on the Wall Street Journal corpus, and I applied it to the judicial opinions in a collection of US Court of Appeals cases. I also wrote a definite clause grammar, or DCG, in Prolog, consisting of approximately 700 rules. And I used the DCG to translate the output from Collins' parser into what I called a quasi-logical form, or QLF, which was intended to be an intermediate step to a full logical form in LLD. And the results on those cases were, were pretty good. But in 2009, working with a student, Tim Armstrong, we tried the same approach with a statute, the Uniform Commercial Code, and the results were poor overall. So we never wrote a full paper on this work, but just presented a short report in a workshop at ICAO 2009. However, if you look more carefully at that project, you'll see that the results varied substantially with sentence structure. Core's fra core phrase structure was quite good, coordinated conjunctions, and, or, et cetera, very bad, prepositional phrase attachment, very bad, and you'll see examples of that as we go along. So here is a very simple example where the output is correct and happens to illustrate the main features of a quasi-logical form. The concrete syntax you will see is a prologue term, but there are four kinds of terms, S term, N term, A term, and P term. An S term is the main relation in a sentence. The N term is an object, usually a noun phrase. A term is a unary predicate, usually an adjective or adverb. And P term is a binary relation, usually a prepositional phrase. There are also pre-modifiers and post-modifiers with variables. Both are shown in this example. Uh, for example, the A term negotiable is a pre-modifier of the N term instruments. That's denoted by the single ampersand. And the P term, two, the prepositional phrase, 
is a post modifier of the S term applies, and that's denoted by the double ampersand. There are also uh, linguistic annotations on the S term, tense and aspect, modal auxiliaries, negation, things like that, and on the N term for determiners. So here's the translation to LLD. Uh, negotiable instrument is defined in uh, section 104A. It's a long definition. Then there's a short definition in 104B that says instrument means a negotiable instrument. Um, so given that, all we need for the translation into LLD is this single atomic formula. So here's another example. Continuing on to 102A, it does not apply to money, to payment orders, etc. cetera. Um, and this example is also correct. You can check the ORs. You can check the prepositional phrase attachments. They all attach to the S term apply. Okay. And then the question is, how do we represent the phrases payment orders governed by and securities governed by? Well, one way is to create new predicates for each phrase, as shown here, and write horn clauses to define the predicates, as shown here. But another way is to use lambda expressions for the original phrases. Now note, so you see lambda G order and lambda M security in this translation. Note that these are higher order lambda expressions since they contain the first order predicate govern, but this is already the case in the horn clause translation to the left, since order and security appear both as predicates and as terms inside govern. Let's now look at some more complex provisions in Article 3 of the UCC. I will initially choose some examples that involve the dionic modalities permission and obligation. Here is section 501A3, which includes the modal auxiliary may. Now the first part of this sentence through Roman numeral one is correct. For example, you can check the prepositional phrase attachments for without and for and see that they are both attached to the S term return. And here is the translation of the main components of QLF, of this QLF into LLD. Now it can be difficult to absorb the details of an example like this in, in such a short time, but I will post the slides and notes online so that you can study them later if you want to. Note here too that presentment, dishonor, endorsement, as well as instrument, which we have seen before, are terms of art in Article 3 with statutory definition. To write this translation in the first place, we need a type system for these terms. And I'm assuming here a system of basic types, which we can refine incrementally as we translate more of the statute. Here is the second part of section 501A3, which is not correct. There are two mistakes. First, the prepositional phrase for is attached to acceptance and it should be attached to refuse. Second, the sequence of ors is in the wrong place, completely out of place. But imagine an interactive system in which we can click on the incorrect structures and move them into the correct positions. Now, I've not implemented such a system, but it is fairly simple to fix this example manually. So here is the correct quasi-logical form, QLF. And here is the translation of the components into LLD. Again, I'm making some initial assumptions about the type system for these terms. You can see here also in the bottom left corner, the, the, the annotation modal may in the QLF. So that's a correct translation from the uh, English sentence. And you see that this provision of the UCC grants a permission to take a disjunctive action. And since we are using a free choice permission in LLD, this is equivalent to a conjunction of permissions for each action. Here is the first permission for Roman numeral one. You can see it has a condition, an action, and an actor, which is in this case, a lambda expression. Here is the second permission for Roman numeral two. Again, a condition, an action, and an actor. And I haven't repeated the actor 
definition here because it's exactly the same. Uh, and that concludes the translation of that uh, provision. Let's now look at a provision that creates an obligation. Here is section 414B. So there are 21 occurrences of the words obliged to in Article 3. 11 as part of a passive verb phrase as here and 10 as a reduced relative clause. For example, the party obliged to pay the draft. There is one mistake in this QLF. The P term according to is attached to obliged and it should be attached to pay. We can fix this mistake as before. Here is the corrected QLF. And here are the main components of the QLF translated into LLD. Here is the obligation. Again, there's a condition, an action, and an actor, just like the permission example before, the permitted example before, but this is oblige, not um, permit. Continuing on with uh, section 414B, here is the second sentence which is correct, you can check the or, you can check the prepositional phrase attachment. Now, if you read this sentence, it's referring to the obligation created by the previous sentence. So we can interpret it as adding additional information to the obliged structure, namely a beneficiary. So now I've extended the obliged structure to have an actor and a beneficiary. And you can see we now have a representation of one of the fundamental Hofeldian relations. From the perspective of, of the beneficiary, um, from the perspective of the beneficiary, this is a right or a claim. From the perspective of the actor, this is a duty. Okay, now I've actually not worked on epistemic modalities in LLD per se, but I'm including the topic here because LLD has all the ingredients that we need to mo model knowledge and belief. This idea goes all the way back to Plato. Knowledge equals justified true belief, but until recently, epistemic logic had no way to represent the qualifier justified. The original modal logic of knowledge was developed by Hintika, and it was based on Kripke semantics or possible world semantics. Um, recently, work by Sergei Artemov and Mel Fitting and others has developed a logic of justifications, which is basically a logic of proofs, and this is significant for LLD because in an intuitionistic logic programming language, it is easy to represent and reason about proofs. I will just show you some examples of epistemic modalities in article three of the UCC. Section 311D is a lengthy provision which contains this subordinate clause as a condition. You see new that the instrument was tendered in full satisfaction of the claim. Here is the proposition inside the epistemic predicate, no. And here is the full epistemic modality. You can see we had simply an actor and a proposition. Another example, 418A also contains a subordinate epistemic clause as a condition. But here it is a mistaken belief, which is an interesting concept. Um, first, there are two syntactic mistakes that we need to correct. Pursuant appears as a constituent of the verb phrase stopped, whereas it should be a modifier of stopped, and the or is in the wrong place again. So here is the corrected QLF, and here, are the two propositions, Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. Now, what does it mean to have a mistaken belief? Presumably it means you believe that a certain proposition is true, but it is actually false. So if we can prove that the drawee believed the disjunction one or two, do we also need to prove not one or two, which is equivalent to not one and not two, and that's equivalence holds both in classical and intuitionistic logic, or is the entire mistaken belief distributed over the disjunction one or two? Here is the second alternative, which seems to be the correct interpretation. So for the first belief, the drawing 
believes that this particular proposition is false, but it is actually true. And in the second believe, the drawee believes that this proposition is true, but it is actually false. Okay, enough examples. Uh, generalizing from these examples, uh, I, I'm suggesting a methodology to encode the complete a complete statute, or in this case, all of Article Three of the UCC. First, define a type system for the statutory domain. I said something about that, but not enough. Second, refine the mapping iteratively from English to QLF to LLD. Now, the mapping to QLF is given by a DCG, a definite clause grammar, consisting, as I said, of approximately 700 rules. The mapping to LLD for Article 3 in this talk was all done manually, of course. We can probably encode most of it in a DCG, but it will depend on the type system uh, very, very closely, and thus it will be specialized to the statutory domain. If we write the DCGs properly, they will be bidirectional. So we can go back from LLD to QLF to English, and then perhaps we can generate French if we want. For Japanese, not sure that the QLF is compatible, but we can always revert back to the LLD. And now the, a critical question, can we improve the accuracy of the parser? Okay, well, Michael Collins' parser is now more than 20 years old. There are better parsers today, and we should run experiments to see how well they do on these UCC examples. But this paradigm in NLP is now considered, quote, old-fashioned, unquote. It's a pipeline architecture from syntactic parse to semantic interpretation to logical rule. The new technology, for example, BERT, does an end-to-end -end mapping with no parse tree in the middle. Now, BERT is useful if we want to retrieve a similar sentence from an embedding in some vector space. There are some good examples of that now. But this will not give us, but this will not give us a logical encoding of a statutory rule, which is what we want for a rules as code project. So a critical question, is there a way to combine machine learning and logical rules? The references that you've been looking at here say, yes, there is. There is not enough time left to discuss this work. It's summarized in section 2.7 of my extended abstract. But I propose this, uh, I have proposed this as a talk at the conference in Singapore in March on computational legal studies. Here is a quick preview, probability geometry logic. That's the main idea. And here is another preview. This is my final slide. And what I've written there is actually a goal, not an, not a, not an accomplishment. Hence the question mark. Thank you. Hello? One question, um, which is all of the. Uh, oh, wait, I. Yeah, uh, how, how um, what has been the uh, your experience interacting with uh, lawyers and legal specialists when you show them this encoding? Have you been able to explain it to them? Have you been able to like, understand okay. the of like all of the code that you showed us on the slide? Oh, could you read that again? Say that again. I had trouble hearing it. I was asking if all of the code that you showed on. I'm sorry, there's a lot of feedback. I was um, asking if all the code that you showed on the slides, you had managed to convey the essence of that code to lawyers. Well, I'm a lawyer and a law professor, so um, I'm, I'm doing both. I'm judging it myself and I'm but, creating yeah, it. Someone but, uh, like some other lawyers with perhaps not your expertise or that are like less familiar with that sort of encodings. Huh. What has your experience yeah. been like no. spreading the word or trying to get more people to adopt that sort of uh, uh, technology? Well, these, okay, the specific examples that I'm showing you now, I have not shown before. 
there are quite a number of examples from the um, ICAIL 2007 paper, uh, which I've discussed with quite a few people, both lawyers and, and computer scientists. Um, as I said, this, the, the work on encoding the UCC, we only presented this at a, at a very short uh, workshop in 2009 because we had not really very strong positive results. And so um, uh, the, the details of the UCC have not been widely, the, of the UCC project have not been widely disseminated at this point. All right. Well